was a dream project. If Arnold's body is the perfect vehicle for his soul, this movie is a kind of perfect vehicle for Arnold. I feel like I was meant for something more than this. This was a very action-oriented picture, very special effects-oriented picture. And of course, this had the brilliance of the Phil Dick concept to play off of, and that's why it was such a milestone movie. It was a thinking man's action movie. Sorry, Quaid. Your whole life is just a dream. Is it the reality of a dream, or is it the reality of somebody that has a dream that comes out of the dream? No, my name is not Quaid. Total Recall was just an action-packed movie. I think it was probably 74 that I optioned this story. It was Phil Dick, who was then not a known author at all. Phil Dick was a struggling pulp writer most of his career until Blade Runner got made. Phil Dick is concerned with what is reality, virtual reality, the idea. You know, you, you feed the senses, and your brain will construct an entire world inside of your mind. Philip Dick went into very well and very clearly that if you have a, a virtual reality, you can't tell the difference. I mean, it's not as if you have a bad, fake virtual reality. I mean, the beauty of the concept is that, no, no, it's a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from reality. Your brain will not know the difference. The original Total Recall, which was then called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, it appeared in one of those magazines I always used to read, Galaxy and Fantasy Science Fiction. And it appeared there, and it was a 23-page short story. This was the first story that knocked me right out, which I knew could make an incredible movie. I knew it would be incredibly expensive. I optioned that for a thousand dollars up front. I became aware of Dan O'Bannon's work. So I went to meet Dan, and he, had, he had just graduated from USC, he was about 28 then, and he said, look, I think we can work together. And we launched in full speed into trying to make Total Recall. And everybody said, no, it's too expensive. Most people who read the first half of the script felt that it was one of the best screenplays they'd ever read. But everybody also kind of agreed that it fell apart in the, somewhere in the second half. There were 40 drafts, but the last draft and the first draft were really essentially no different, like in the point that nobody had solved the third act. The second act didn't come too hard. About a year it took us. But three or four years before that third act, the inspiration of everybody can relate to our air is choking. And when they punished the Martian mutants, they just threatened to cut off their air. So when they did that to them, then the hero could do this larger than life gesture if he could turn the device that the aliens had left millions of years ago buried and the whole planet would get atmosphere. So we had our ending and the whole story seemed to just fall right into place. Total Recall was around for years and years and years. And it went from one place to the other, from one producer to the other, from one studio to the other. And uh, it finally settled with Dina De Laurentiis. They had stayed for a very long time. Many directors were attached, like Cronenberg, for example. As I recall, there were seven directors, most prominently sticking out in my mind, was Richard Rush, who did The Stuntman. He and Dino couldn't agree because he liked our third act of Total Recall, and Dino didn't. The new Mars gets air. I said, no like. I said, why? He said, air, too hard. I can't visualize. And Richard Rush said, but it's wonderful. You know, it works perfectly. He said, Dick, I can't go with you as director. I, I don't even want to go to Mars. And I said, well, you can't take that. It's in my contract, you know. He said, it'll never get made. I said, fine, I'd rather never make it. And I said, the Mars, Mars is in, and Mars gets here. It'll work. It's the first ending that's worked. You know, show it to another director. So one day, I get a call. He says, Ron, I love you so much, I could kiss you on the mouth. You saved me. Are you so goddamn stubborn, you saved me. I showed this script to Bruce Beresford. First director I showed it to, I say, you know, take out Mars, take out air. He said, Dino, you full of shit. He said, I'm a full of shit. He's right. He said, the best thing in it is Mars and air. We go. Come to the house. We go with this version. So we, I went to that house, we all hugged each other, and Bruce started, went to Australia and we started pre-production with Patrick Swayze in the lead. And it was during that period, after all this time, seven years, that Dino's public company, which we had formed a year or two earlier, finally had several flops in a row and he had to go bankrupt and that included the Total Recall project. So Beresford called us and he says, the movie's off, Dino's gone bankrupt, he fired 80 people and they're tearing down the sets as I look out the window. And we had thought that was it. Let's do it. 
do what? Move to Mars. Arnold had always loved it, but he wasn't as big a star as he was. He read it four years earlier. Well, I was always on top of that movie and checked it out because I loved that story. Dina felt that uh, the story would work much better if uh, it's not me starring it. And he had his reasons for it. I was uh, not about to, to argue his reasons because he had his and I had mine why I should be doing it, of course. You know, that was the way it went. Drive! Drive! Would you please repeat the destination? Arnold really wanted to do it and never got the chance. Dino was very uh, adamant, you won't get it. So when the, when the project was in jeopardy and when Dino had to sell it, Arnold rushed to Mario Casar and said, that is the script you have to buy from me. So they bought it. Within the next few hours, they made a deal. And then I get this call from Arnold and he says, Ron, he said, uh, Get ready, pack your bags, we go. We're going to make the movie. I said, what movie? He says, isn't there a movie you've been trying to make for about 10 years? I said, oh, it's in bankruptcy. He said, well, I just took it out. Back up. We're going to be making the movie right away. And that was it. In the original versions, the character was more like a kind of timid, um, nearly accountant type, which was completely a different approach. I thought that that switch from being powerful physically and then being put in the position of being vulnerable is a much more, a, a stronger kind of contrast. And that's why I thought that the character should be uh, played by me rather than by someone that is an ordinary kind of a looking guy. You know from the minute you see Arnold, that eventually he's going to go in the phone booth, take off his shirt and Superman, and here we go. No way do, did we feel that it was acceptable to make Arnold Schwarzenegger somebody who was basically a timid guy. That was not Arnold. The first thing I did was I called Paul Verhoeven and I said, remember when we met a few months ago after you came out with Robocop? And I said to you, he says, Paul, you and I, we have to work together. You're exactly in my style of directing, my style of visual looks. It's a visual feast watching your movies. It's like extraordinary. So, so he says, yeah, I remember that. And I said, well, I have the project for us now. Arnold needs a director that he really um, respects. And Paul's like a real tough guy. And Arnold's a big 900-pound uh, canary. You know, he squawks. You get, he gets what he wants. But uh, uh, he respects Paul a lot. Paul has a certain way of directing. He's very energetic. He's outrageous. You know, he's, he's always continuously, you know, like, well, I, I, I think that you, you, you can go around the corner, I mean, much faster, and then you go bang, 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 bang. Can you not? I mean, it, uh, why not? I mean, let's do it again. Let's do it again. I mean, this is how he talks. All the time, it's like you said. I pushed him, you know, and I, 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 I helped him. I was laying with him on the floor or in the mud and saying, it's like this, and you should, I think you have to give more accent to this word or push this a little bit harder. It has to be a bit faster. Don't be so slow. Do it three, four, five times. And because Arnold is a guy that has, in fact, no ego in that direction, you know, he's not like, oh, basically, don't hurt me. It's more like, oh, fuck, yeah. I mean, he's open-minded. It's, it's somebody that looks, looks at his own problems, mistakes, or whatever, and is able to deal with that instead of saying, they're not true. It's all fine. I'm great. I'm wonderful. He's not like that at all. And all of a sudden, all the pieces came together in that, and we didn't go to Australia. We went to Mexico. Paul sent me to the Ames Research Institute in uh, San Francisco. They sent me to Houston to walk on the space lab. We started contacting colleges that were doing research on how one might live on another planet, gathering research, showing it to Paul. And then he felt free to make a movie, <laughs> like a normal movie. You get illustrators in, starting to draw uh, concepts that are uh, in the script. We built models of different settings in the movie. It was a pretty big budget movie at the time, very, you know, pretty expensive movie. And uh, the only way we'd, we could do it is to go down to Mexico. And there were 10 stages, nine of them we kept uh, building sets. And so every stage had maybe three or four sets built on them to fill these huge 180 by 80, 90 foot wide stages. We worked seven days a week for almost nine, 10 months. And it was the only way to get it done. There were uh, local locations that we used. We used, the, I think, the Zocalo down in the uh, subway system. But of course, we also repainted the whole subway system, painted it gray. So even if we were on location, it was a monumental task. Ah! 
the choice of going to Mexico City was a great choice because the architecture in Mexico City is unlike anything else. We found architecture that's called um, New Brutalism. It was a very dark, a bit, bit heavy-handed, concrete style that gave the movie a very definite architectural um, a, a production design. We felt that it would be nice to be inside a nuclear reactor. You know, nuclear reactors, they have these poles that go in, in water. And I thought, okay, if, suppose that these poles are gigantic, you know, that they are like, like skyscrapers, that big, and they're hanging from the ceiling. What we found which was uh, skyscrapers that were designed, um, let's say, in a kind of a really a bit surrealistic way in the beginning of the century. And Bill Flandell was looking at these things, and then so somehow he say, well, you know, that's yeah, something like that, but how do we do that? It would stick out out of the ground and something like that. And so he threw it on the ground, the book. But it came in a situation on the ground that it was reversed. So suddenly the skyscrapers that were raising up were hanging down. And then we looked at, these, at, at, at it and looked at each other and said, wow! That's it, that we're going to do, that looks great. The experience in Mexico working with Arnold and the crew, and the Mexican crew we had, which was a great crew too, I mean, it was wonderful. And I think back to Total Recall with a lot of, 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 of warmth and pleasure. Everybody be careful, yeah? Whenever you shoot in Mexico, that weeds out uh, right away the strong from the wimps. You know, you're in the middle of like the smog capital of the actually the world the breathing was like two packs a day of cigarettes just to breathe the air in mexico city our uh, uh producer slash upm elliot schick one of the toughest guys in hollywood had to be uh medevaced out his eyeballs bugged out paul was very sick near the end he used to have an ambulance i think on the set for him so that they could you know give him fluid and everything to keep him going and one had to be constantly mindful of the sprinting distance to the nearest restroom at any time you were filming. And that, of course, added a layer of complexity to what we were doing. The Americans sometimes get really carried away with all this kind of stuff, you know, living clean and, and not, not to give any germs notice. Everybody laughed at me because I was a complete hypochondriac. I was terrified to go to Mexico. I wouldn't brush my teeth with any water but bottled water. And finally, every week, I insisted on a B-12 shot. <laughs> Everybody said, what good is that? That's bullshit crap, you know. But I was one of the, the only two people that didn't get sick were me and Arnold. He survived very, very well. I mean, he had his own food flown in from Los Angeles, and he had his own cook that was making his stuff in, in his trailer. And so um, the only time that he got sick was when his cook got sick and he had to eat with us. <laughs> <laughs> It was clear that uh, to ke keep the budget in balance, we could not afford next to Arnold some ac other people that would be t extremely expensive. Rachel came in the first day and Sharon came in the second day. And I did scenes with them personally. I just tested them and did the scenes of Arnold. And after three days of casting, I said to Arnold, I think we have the girls, you know. I mean, this is Rachel and this is Sharon. <laughs> It's nice to be aggressive, uh, you know, every once in a while. I mean, in the, in the martial arts thing, we, we were punching um, pads, and, and I really found that <laughs> enjoyable, you know? I mean, now I understand why people have, you know, punching bags in their, in their homes. It does. It gets out a lot of aggression. So I, you know, I get into it. What a bitch. I'd like to show you my honorary stunt woman association. <laughs> I earned this, okay? Sharon Stone was terrific to work with because she was as dedicated as all the other ones were. She was training like a machine. I mean, she was like the female Terminator. I shot for, for a couple weeks on this film and then went home and came back. When I got home the first time, I looked like a Dalmatian because when you throw a punch and it just stops against Arnold's arm, it's like hitting a brick wall about 60 miles an hour. I was just black and blue and sore and just i couldn't believe it you know how much i hate this fucking planet